my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. I, uh, I'm going to call this episode 296. It's an unusual episode. I've never done one like this before. First of all, I guess I got to say, though, that by the time this gets recorded and edited and put out, I'm watching the Giants game in a little bit, but this will come out after the Giants and Eagles game on Thursday Night Football. I don't really know who's going to win. Neither team is very good. And uh, I guess that means that technically an episode about NFL Week 6 is going to overlap into NFL Week 7. If that bothers you, hey, no problem. You can skip this episode. Hope you have a great day. We'll see you in 297. And uh, I, I appreciate you even clicking on this at all. You're awesome. Hope you have a great day. If you don't want to watch it or listen to it, no problem. But this is an unusual episode of Strong Opinion Sports because I want to do predictions versus reality for NFL Week 6. Revisit my predictions. I've actually never done that midweek before. I've always, I do usually predictions versus reality for my full season long predictions. How's the team do? Like I predict the Cardinals go 12 and 4. And then in February or March, we do a video hey, what happened with my prediction versus the reality of what went on? I've never done it mid year. And so I honestly cannot tell, is this going to be a really long episode? Is this going to be a really short episode? I have no idea. I hope you enjoy it. I just wanted to do it. And um, I, I like talking about not just what I get right. Like, sure, what I get right is interesting. But I love diving into the things I get wrong and talking about what happened. Like, how was I wrong? Why was I wrong? It's wild and interesting to me. Uh, for, like, for example, I was very, very wrong about the... Patriots and the Broncos game, and I want to I want to dive into that kind of stuff. So it took me a while I had to watch all the NFL Week Six games. That's a lot of football to watch, um, but as a result, we can have a fun time diving into the you know my predictions and comparing them to the reality of what happened. And uh, I just I, I'm gonna have a good time. I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, I've never done one like this. I normally would probably if this is really really short, I apologize. If it's really short. Then maybe next week I'll try to fit it in as just a topic on a bigger episode. Um, but I will, I just honestly don't know what to expect here. So we'll see how it goes. I want to jump into the Steelers and the Browns. Now, going into the Steelers-Browns game, I was pretty noncommittal. I didn't know what to make of it. Uh, you know, there were three games last weekend where I just was like, well, you know what? We're going to learn a lot. We'll see what happens. So this was the number one game for me where I said, we're going to learn a lot about the Steelers and who they are as a football team. And we're going to learn a lot about the Browns quarterback, Baker Mayfield. Who is he as a quarterback? And the question for me was, can Baker Mayfield, the Browns quarterback, go toe-to-toe with Big Ben, the Steelers quarterback? And in case you don't know, the Steelers won this game 38-7. to And I guess what we really learned for me is that, wow, uh, the Steelers are a playoff team. They are a really... They rolled through the Browns. I mean, the Browns were limited to 75 yards rushing. And part of that's because they were down. And when you're losing by a lot, you tend to abandon the run. You got to throw the ball to try to come back. But Pittsburgh dominated on both sides of the ball on offense and on defense. The Steelers, they ran for 129 yards. Um, you know, they're running back at 101 yards rushing. Big Ben as a quarterback is awesome. And I, I feel very, very good about Pittsburgh. This game for me solidified, yeah. The Steelers are legit. They showed up big time on Sunday. And uh, for me, in case, I mean, kind of my big problem with the Browns right now, and I know that, and I did a whole topic about the Browns earlier, so I don't, I don't want to talk too much about this, but Baker Mayfield, yes, he had a rib injury on Sunday. He had it going in. He got pulled in the third quarter when they were losing by a lot. But regardless of Baker Mayfield's injury, decision-making has been a problem for Baker Mayfield and really, it's the lack of consistency from a decision-making standpoint where the Browns are I, – I actually compared them to a, a high-performance sports car. The Browns have a great head, uh, head coach, Colin Plays. They got a bunch of playmakers. They just need a race car driver to keep the car on the track. Just drive it in a straight line and don't crash. And for the love of God, please don't make horrible mistakes. And Baker continues to make – Really bad mistake after mistake after mistake. Baker Mayfield is becoming the limiting factor for the Browns offense. And that's not good. He's running out of time. And if Baker doesn't play better moving forward, at some point they're going to say, 
we got to bench you, dude. You're you're just not efficient enough. You're throwing bad interceptions. And, you know, the Browns have a new head coach and a new general manager, neither of which is tied to Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield is not safe. He might feel safe. He might feel like I was a number one overall pick. They're going to like me. They're going to be with me. But that's just not true. And if Baker doesn't deliver, the Browns are going to move on. Kevin Savance is going to say, we need to find a new quarterback. And even me, I'm a guy who I'm one of like the last human beings on planet Earth defending and rooting for and wanting to see Baker Mayfield succeed. A lot of people already bailed a long time ago. And even I, a person who I, I see a lot of humanity in Baker Mayfield. He's a flawed person. I have I literally do a podcast with my girlfriend called Flawed Humans. Like I understand when people you are successful and you're a human being and it's hard to be called out and you want to make money and there's a lot of stuff going on. So I, I understand the humanity of Baker Mayfield, but even I, a person who I want to see Baker succeed in life and succeed as a quarterback. I'm losing patience with him. And I know that if I'm losing patience with Baker Mayfield, that's a bad sign. Because I feel like I'm one of the last people on planet Earth defending the guy. And I guess defending the guy is the wrong word, but holding out hope that Baker Mayfield's going to work out. And so Baker Mayfield has got to figure things out and play better moving forward for the Browns. And uh, he is in danger of losing his job in Cleveland. Now the Bears and the Panthers... Carolina was 3-2 and two going into this game, and their fan base kept telling me, the Carolina Panthers were a playoff team. We got Teddy Bridgewater, a new coach, Joe Brady. Oh, yeah, the Panthers, they're so great. Eh, I was skeptical. I went, well, let's see what's happening. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Like This is kind of a, a prove-it game for the Panthers. If they're really legit, they're going to beat the Chicago Bears. And I saw this game as being an interesting close game that the Bears would win. And honestly, this game went exactly like I said it would. The Chicago Bears won 23-16. Teddy Bridgewater had an interception early on in this game on the very first drive. That one's debatable. It was a contested pass, got tipped up in the air. We can say that's on his fault. But on the final drive for Carolina, Teddy had his second interception with a minute left in the game. And that was an opportunity to put together a game-winning drive that failed because of Teddy Bridgewater. That can't happen. That's not good. I like Teddy. I've been saying for a while that he's very good for now. He's a duct tape quarterback. I thought he kind of proved that on Sunday against the Bears. Uh, the Bears quarterback, Nick Foles, was fine. Good enough to win. He's not outstanding. And it's definitely not always pretty with Nick Foles. But his teammates like him. He's the right guy in Chicago. This game, I don't have a lot to say here because the game kind of went exactly like I thought it would. Again, the Bears got a close win, and the Panthers, a team I was skeptical of, was not good enough to beat Chicago. Chicago's 5-1, and one, and uh, Carolina's 3-3. Three and three. That sounds about right to me based on what I saw going into the game. Now, the Dolphins and the Jets, this game, it's barely worth talking about. I said, you know, quote, the Miami Dolphins should wreck the New York Jets on Sunday. They did. The Dolphins beat the Jets 24 to nothing. The Jets quarterback, Sam Darnold, didn't play at all. He's hurt. And the Dolphins are a legit football team. They need to start getting the respect they deserve. Brian Flores, the head coach in Miami, is doing some really, really good stuff. It's I like what Brian Flores did because Brian Flores, unlike a lot of, he's a Bill Belichick understudy head coach, one of the, the head coaches from Bill Belichick's coaching tree. And a lot of quarterbacks that a lot of, excuse me, a lot of head coaches who coach under Bill Belichick, then go do their own thing later. We're talking about Bill O'Brien, uh, that guy, what's his name? He coached for the Browns and the Jets. He was really bad. Um, we're talking about Matt Patricia. A lot of people who coach under Bill Belichick, then go coach on their own as a head coach. They try to be clones of Bill Belichick. And the problem is when you're not Bill Belichick, you don't have the cachet to get away with the things Bill can do. Bill, you can't be as cold and as, as calculated. The way that Bill Belichick is, he's very cold. He's very cutthroat a little bit with his players. He'll cut you on in a heartbeat. That doesn't exactly work unless you're Bill Belichick with his resume and the Super Bowls he's won. So Brian Flores, what I love is he has taken Bill Belichick's ideas and his formula and the lessons he learned from him and then put his own spin on it. And the... Players in Miami have really, really responded to that. They love Brian Flores. They fight for him. The best thing he does is the expectations are very, very clear. Bill Belichick does that very well. Brian Flores does that very, very well. People in the building like him. I know some people there. They talk very highly of him. 
And uh, there are two teams that I strongly believe are headed in the right direction. That's Carolina with Matt Rule and the Miami Dolphins with Brian Flores. He's a great head coach. He deserves to get some credit. Nobody seems to want to give Brian Flores the credit he deserves for what he's doing in Miami. And uh, it starts with a head coach. I really like what Carolina has. I like what Miami has. Miami has their quarterback, Tua. He's starting in two weeks in NFL uh, Week 8. Tua got in the game against the Jets. He had uh, two, you know, two passing plays, was two for two, and uh, got shortly named the starting quarterback right after that. So I am very excited about Miami. I can't believe I talked that long about them. But this game as a whole was, hey, the Jets are awful. They, they're just a gigantic mess. And, by the way, the Dolphins need to start getting some recognition for what they're doing. A great team is supposed to beat the Jets by a lot. That's what they did. They beat the 49ers handily two weeks ago. You better start paying attention and giving the Dolphins the respect that they deserve. And uh, I, I just want to see that happen for them. Now, the Rams and 49ers. Going in, I felt very strongly that the Rams would win this game. You know, the 49ers were dealing with injuries. Jimmy Garoppolo, the 49ers quarterback, has not played very well recently. And the Rams, Rams offense, to this point, Jared Goff, Sean McVay, they've been rolling, man. And uh, I just got to say, I got this one very, very wrong. I, I, I thought the Rams won, would win by two touchdowns, maybe pulling away. And, in fact, the 49ers won 24-16. to 16. And a lot happened here. A lot of stuff went on to cause this to happen. Number one is that the 49ers did a really good job managing their quarterback, Jimmy Garoppolo. So I don't feel great about Jimmy Garoppolo's arm talent. And I am still very concerned that I mean, we even saw this against the Miami Dolphins. When Jimmy Garoppolo has to throw the ball downfield and win throwing the ball vertically, I don't know that he can. But the 49ers did not ask a lot of him against L.A. They had a ton of screen passes. They threw the ball behind the line of scrimmage a lot. And the 49ers head coach Kyle Shanahan deserves a lot of credit. The 49ers are really banged up. They have a lot of injuries. And they still found a way to beat the Rams. That's a big deal. The Rams offense, I guess the Rams defense, excuse me. LA's defense never forced Jimmy Garoppolo to have to throw the ball vertically downfield. And because the Rams also didn't get a single sack all game, part of that is because the 49ers were getting rid of the ball very quickly, throwing a lot of screens. They didn't have a sack all day. Aaron Donald had no sacks. The Rams had, did not have a single sack the entire game. That speaks to the 49ers' game plan. That also speaks to the fact that the Rams did never force Jimmy G to hold on to the ball or work to his fourth or fifth read in the progression. And so I was surprised about that. I was also very, very surprised that Jared Goff, the Rams quarterback, struggled the way he did. Cooper Cup, the kind of the security blanket for Jared Goff, was targeted nine times in this game. He only had three catches for 11 yards. That's very, very surprising because not once, not twice, multiple times, Cooper Cup was open vertically or downfield, and Jared Goff simply missed him. And I go, how is that possible? Your favorite receiver, the guy you know best, you couldn't connect with? Downfield multiple times? And that's, I just was very surprised how often Jared Goff missed Cooper Cup open downfield. And uh, it's also worth noting that 49ers corner Emmanuel Mosley was back from an injury. He played great. He made a big impact on the game. And uh, I guess the final thing I want to say about the 49ers is that Despite the fact that they put together a really good game plan, they found a way to win against the Rams, I thought the guy that deserves the most credit here was Kyle Shanahan, the head coach of the 49ers. Like, finding a way to win, despite all the problems on your roster and the injuries going on, that's a big deal. But I am still very, very skeptical of Jimmy Garoppolo, the 49ers quarterback, because he struggles to throw the ball vertically when he's forced to. So I don't know that at some point, the 49ers are going to play a defense that takes away the running game and limits screens and, you know, sort stuff underneath. And when you make Jimmy Garoppolo have to throw to his fourth or fifth or maybe even third read, that's going to be a problem for the 49ers. And I, I foresee that being an issue later down the road. <clears throat> now, the Patriots and the Broncos. This is another game I was very, very wrong about. And I was certain that the New England Patriots are going to win this football game. I was nervous for the Broncos' young quarterback, Drew Locke. I kept having kind of a vision of Sam Darnold against the Patriots 
Remember that game where Sam Darnold was, quote, seeing ghosts? And I thought, man, a young quarterback against this Patriots defense, that feels like a recipe for disaster. Now, the Broncos beat the Patriots 18-12. to I was dead wrong here. Uh, Brandon McManus hit six field goals. And what I loved here was the Broncos' game plan on offense. They were all attack, attack, attack. They kept attacking vertically. And whether, I, I don't know, I, I felt like Drew Locke left a lot on the table to be desired. But what I really loved is that he was not afraid. He kept launching deep ball after deep ball, going after the Patriots' secondary and you just do not see that very often from a young quarterback playing against the New England Patriots. And normally when that happens, you see a lot of interceptions or really bad problems. He kept throwing vertically, throw after throw after throw. There was a Broncos third and 21 play where Drew Locke threw a long 35-yard bomb down the right sideline at Tim Patrick. And I went, oh, wow. This is just not at all how I thought the game was going to go. And I know Denver wants a lot of credit here. And we'll talk about Denver and kind of the credit they deserve. But I also got to say that this is honestly the worst game I've ever seen New England play in my entire life watching them. At least in the Bill Belichick era where it was sloppy. They were awful. I blame COVID. I mean, they haven't practiced very much. They look disorganized. Their game plan was very weird, like kind of thrown together. Now, Cam did have a huge run. When you're not very well prepared, it kind of comes down to who has better athletes. The Broncos definitely do have better athletes. And I thought Cam, you know, for his credit, Cam did what he could. He had this long run where it looked like nobody wanted to tackle him. And I just had this thought. I went, man, it's really disappointing that we're never, ever going to see Cam Newton play in the same backfield as Derrick Henry. If someone ever said, hey, Zach, you know, genie in a bottle, you get to pick anything for the NFL. What would you want to see? I actually think the thing I'd most want to see just from a it'd be fun and interesting to watch would be. Cam Newton running the zone read with Derrick Henry. Nobody would want to tackle anybody on defense. He'd be like, yeah, I don't want to touch Cam Newton, and I don't want to get run over by Derrick Henry, so I just think that'd be really fun to watch. Now, the Patriots had a chance to win this football game. Drew Locke threw back-to-back interceptions down the stretch in this game, and so the Patriots had the ball first and 10, three minutes to go, down six, and they couldn't finish the drive. I mean, Cam Newton took a sack. That was kind of the, the nail in the coffin. They were in fourth and long, and they couldn't finish the drive. This was an ugly game. Both teams were depleted because of COVID and because of injuries. But Denver won. I mean, Denver won in a weird way. It's not very often you have a team score 18 points with six field goals. It's just kind of a, a showing of bad football. Drew Locke wasn't perfect either. Drew Locke had two interceptions. Just kind of was... I like it. I thought what my favorite thing about Drew Locke was not that he was incredibly efficient or that he really shredded the Patriots. What I loved was his confidence. He was just not afraid at all of the Patriots defense. He kept recognizing matchups, doing a great job. Whether he succeeded or not throwing completions, he was just attacking vertically. And I, I really like that attitude. And I think as time goes on and Drew Locke gets better and the people around him get healthy and Cortland Sutton comes back, and K.J. Handler comes back, and Noah Fant comes back, and he's got two great running backs. I am telling people, Drew Locke is going to be a terrifying force when he figures things out, and the team around him is at 100% and really healthy. The Broncos are going to be a problem next year because Drew Locke, I've never seen a young quarterback stand up to the Patriots the way Drew Locke did. I was totally wrong about this game. Denver won, and it was fun and exciting to watch for me. Now, the Ravens and the Eagles, I said that the Ravens should win this game very easily. They have a better roster, not to mention that Carson Wentz, Eagles quarterback, had been really struggling with, I called him depressingly inconsistent to that point in the year. Well, the Ravens did win. They won 30 to 28, but the Ravens did not win as easily as I expected them to do. Baltimore was up 17 to nothing at halftime, and it's worth noting that the Eagles' first six drives, they had... Five three and outs and a fumble. Like The Eagles did not start this game well at all. But I want to give credit to Philadelphia and credit to Carson Wentz because they fought back, man. The Eagles were in this game. It was close. It was interesting. It was intense. And um, I, I really want to give them credit, man. The Eagles fought all the way back. Now, Travis Fulgham is a name you might not have heard of. He is a former sixth-round pick. He had another good game for Philadelphia. I'm starting to go, yeah. 
Travis Fulgham, I, I wasn't sure at first. I was like, ah, let's wait and see. I've never heard of him before. I want to do some research. Travis Fulgham looks like the real deal. He might be the most exciting Eagles receiver. He had six catches on Sunday, 75 yards, and another touchdown. And it's kind of sad that Travis Fulgham, a former sixth-round pick, is the most exciting receiver for Philadelphia. N- instead of, you know, their top picks recently, they had, you know, uh, J.J. Arcega Whiteside. They had <laughs> Jalen Rager. We're not, I'm not really excited about either one of those guys so far this year. The guy I'm excited about is Travis Fulgham. That's weird and sad and honestly incredibly disappointing when it comes down to the picks the Eagles have made recently at receiver. I was excited to watch Jalen Rager. He's been injured a lot. And even when he wasn't injured, he's been like, ah, like kind of inconsistent. So I also want to say that down 17 to nothing, Philadelphia made a decision I didn't agree with. They On fourth and one at the 20-yard line, Doug Peterson decided to go for it on fourth and one rather than kick the easy field goal. And there were that moment along with a couple other moments of kind of weird, what I would call mismanagement, where I, I thought, you know, first of all, the Ra- the Eagles left three points on the board there. That would have really helped them. That would have gave them the lead. Now, we I think also the Ravens would have played things differently if the Eagles had three more points on the board. Maybe they would have called different plays down the stretch, but... Regardless, I just feel like Doug Peterson has been mismanaging a couple moments so far this year, and I go, ah, he's won a Super Bowl. He gets the benefit of the doubt for sure, but I, I'm not that impressed with Doug Peterson so far this year in 2020. Now, the Ravens won, sure. Congratulations, Baltimore. Well done for you. Uh, but they did not win as easily as I thought. It was kind of an ugly game for them. And my number one takeaway for the Baltimore Ravens is that this team needs to work on the scramble drill. So when Lamar Jackson is outside of the pocket extending a play, his receivers are stagnant. They're just not really moving. They're not really looking for the ball very much. They need to come back for the ball. They need to start working on, hey, if Lamar rolls right, you got to get rolling to the right sideline. One of you goes vertical. One of you comes back. One of you goes to the sideline. They need to have these rules figured out and have that start to happen because multiple times I've watched the Ravens, their receivers just are doing nothing as Lamar is extending a play and rolling to the right or left. And uh, I I just, Baltimore needs to work on the scramble drill. Also, I'm not that impressed with Lamar Jackson so far this year throwing the football. He looks great running. He was great again against Philadelphia. Had a long touchdown run. But throwing the ball, he's still been incredibly inconsistent. That's disappointing. And I really expected more from Lamar this year. I thought... I thought he's going to take another step forward throwing the football. I just haven't seen it so far this year from uh, from Lamar Jackson, and I maybe we will as time goes on. But so far, I've been kind of like, ah, Lamar. I want to see more. I want to see more consistency, and we're just not from Lamar Jackson. Now the Colts and the Bengals. Oh my gosh, I was torn about this game. I said that on paper, the Colts should win this game easily. But the problem is their quarterback, Phillip Rivers, never makes things easy. And Joe Burrow, a young, phenomenal up-and-coming quarterback against the Colts' defense, is going to be a surprisingly interesting matchup. Now, here's what happened. The Colts won the game 31-27. to But the Bengals actually, like I said, they were surprisingly interesting. The Bengals had a 21 to nothing lead early on in this game. They were helped out by a... The Colts fumbled on their first drive. Like, things went really, really well for the uh, for the Bengals. But I got to say, man, I am all in on the Bengals' young quarterback, Joe Burrow. He looks really, really good. And for me, what I like is, and he had a, I guess let's address the elephant in the room. So, Joe Burrow had one really bad, costly mistake in this game. He had an interception on the final play, I guess on the final drive, with like 46 seconds left that kind of ruined the Bengals' comeback where they the Bengals had an opportunity to go down the field, win the game. Joe Burrow did not see the backside safety. The guy came, got an interception. Joe Burrow had that one bad play all game. And that's, it's frustrating when you see a young quarterback do that in that moment. But I also got to say that Joe Burrow, other than that one moment, his attention to detail was incredible. I just, I keep going, oh my God, 
he's recognizing the recognizing when a blitz is coming. He's recognizing coverages really well. If you blitz and leave one-on-one coverage outside, he'll find that. He had a long throw to T. Higgins. I went, dang, that's a really great read. And I got to say, Joe Burrow is the best young quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, I addressed the interception. That was frustrating. But other than that, man, he looks phenomenal. He leapfrogged every other young quarterback in the NFL. I would take Joe Burrow over Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, everybody. Joe Burrow is making great decisions, making veteran-level reads, seeing the field incredibly well. He's extending the play well. And most importantly is that Joe Burrow is on a team that really is not as good as players like Lamar Jackson's got a great roster in Baltimore. And Kyler Murray has incredible receivers. Like, (laughs) he has DeAndre Hopkins and... Josh Allen's got this great defense and a really good team around him in Buffalo. Joe Burrow has the Cincinnati Bengals, a team that was awful. They earned the number one overall pick last year. And Joe Burrow is elevating the team around him from his attitude, from his leadership, from his attention to detail, his play literally on the field. Joe Burrow is the best young quarterback in the NFL. And I will say that, and I will not back down. I will die on that hill. Joe Burrow is phenomenal. Now, by halftime... Things did even out. Uh, the Colts were only losing by three points. The Bengals had a 24 to 21 lead. The Colts fought back. And so, and you're like, were you talking about Joe Burrow or the Colts? Yeah, we're still talking about the Colts Bengals game. Phillip Rivers had a bad interception, as he always does, but I still got to say that this was the best game I've ever seen Phillip Rivers play in a Colts uniform. The Colts fought back. And so I thought that. It was disappointing. The Bengals had an opportunity and missed a field goal, which would have been the go-ahead field goal. But you got to give the Colts a lot of credit. Phillip Rivers fought back. He really did a great job leading his team back to victory. And uh, I just, I I was fired up. I, yeah, Phillip Rivers, great job. I thought that the early really big lead by the Bengals was less about the Colts being bad and more about the Bengals getting a couple early breaks, plus Joe Burrow making some really good plays. So I don't think it's an indictment against the Colts. And uh, what's really cool is that Indianapolis showed a lot of adversity, and they fought back. And finally, 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 I watched the Colts game and went, yeah, Phillip Rivers looks really good, like the way I thought he would play all year. So maybe this is the start of something really, really good for Phillip Rivers moving forward where he's going to leapfrog off of this moment and play phenomenal the rest of the year. I don't know, but I think it's possible Phillip Rivers you know, uses this game as a Stepping stone to play really good the rest of the year. Now, the Giants and Washington. I thought Washington was going to win this game. I believe Kyle Allen, their quarterback, was going to play a really clean game. And I thought that Washington was going to have a number of sacks on the Giants quarterback, Daniel Jones. I was flat out wrong about this game. Just wrong. Like, there's nothing. I, I Both things I thought were going to happen for Washington failed. The Giants won 20 to 19. The Giants got their first win of the year. I was happy for them. And Kyle Allen made some good plays for Washington, but he also had two really costly turnovers. Turnovers that cannot happen. Turnovers that I am sure head coach Ron Rivera looked at and went, you can't throw that interception or you can't fumble that ball. You got to get rid of it and throw the ball away. So there are little things that Kyle Allen, even Kyle Allen, the quote, I think the best quarterback for Washington needs to do better. Um, And the game came down to, it was really fun to watch. It came down to a two-point conversion for Washington with literally seconds left in the game. They did not get it. The Giants won. But I think most surprising in this game was that Washington only had one sack the entire game. The the team in Washington, and I I wish I had a name. I hate calling them Washington. They have five first-round picks on the defensive line. They have a lot of talent on their defensive line. And I was like, man, Chase Young is going to go off. And it didn't happen. Daniel Jones got sacked one time on Sunday. That's just, I I thought that, man, Washington didn't show up the way I thought they would on defense. Daniel Jones is, I don't know. I I need to watch the Thursday night game. I haven't watched that game. That game's uh, happening in a couple minutes. Um, But I... I'm excited to watch the Giants. I think Daniel Jones, I don't know. I did a whole topic about it, but I I was really surprised that Washington did not have a quarterback play a clean game, and they did not get only, they only got one sack on Daniel Jones the entire game. That's a surprise to me, 
and that is how the Giants got their first win. Now, the Falcons and the Vikings. This was an ugly game. This was two bad teams. The Vikings, I thought, had a better roster going in. Uh, but the Falcons, remember, the Falcons coach, Dan Quinn, was fired. And I said, maybe Atlanta will feel liberated, and maybe Atlanta will be out to prove that, hey, it was the coach's fault, not our fault, the players. The players are good. Our coach was a problem. And uh, the Falcons won this game 40-23. to Now, so both teams are 1-5. and five. It was just an ugly, not a great game. But this felt like the low point for Minnesota so far this year, where their defense got shredded by Atlanta. And remember, Mike Zimmer, the head coach of the Vikings, is supposed to be a defensive-minded coach. They got embarrassed. And Kirk Cousins was also incredibly embarrassing. He was awful. And I know that the statistics won't show Kirk Cousins like, yeah, he got three touchdowns, but he did it in garbage time, down by a bunch. And when it mattered most in the first half, Kirk Cousins had three interceptions. He played really badly. And the stats are misleading, but Kirk was terrible in this game. This was the low point for the Kirk Cousins era in Minnesota. They're one in five, the Vikings are. I think the coach might get fired. I think Kirk Cousins might get I mean, they can't, he's got a contract. I don't know what to do there. It's a guaranteed contract. So the Vikings are in trouble, and I don't know that they have the answers to solve their problems uh, unless they get a new head coach who's just really a genius on offense. I don't know what they're going to do. So uh, the Vikings are in really, really big trouble after losing this game to Atlanta. Now, the Texans and the Titans. I felt like the Bills kind of got a, they got handed a, a victory two weeks ago against Buffalo, where, I guess what am I saying, the Titans got handed a victory by Buffalo two weeks ago. If you watch that Titans-Bills game on that Tuesday night, the Bills were terrible, and I thought after that game, people went, oh my gosh, the Tennessee Titans destroyed the Buffalo Bills. And I go, did you watch the game? Like, yeah, the stats were were interesting. Like, the numbers, like the final score, wow, the Titans destroyed the Bills. But I actually went kind of like, "Eh, well, if you watch the game, Tennessee got break after break after break. And I I just was not all in on the Titans as this dominant juggernaut team. So I believed in this game against Houston that Tennessee was going to win the game, but it was going to be close and it was going to be interesting and competitive. And so I'm not going to act like some genius here because this game went to overtime. So really either team could have won, but I did get it right where I said it was going to be close and the Titans were going to win. The Titans beat the Texans 42 to 36 in overtime, it took overtime to figure out the winner of this game. Derrick Henry had 212 yards rushing for Tennessee. The tight, the Houston Texans quarterback, Deshaun Watson, was outstanding, though. He was 28 for 37 passing, 335 yards, four touchdowns. And yeah, Tennessee is a playoff team. I, I think they look really, really good. I think what's most cool about the Titans is the way that they have found ways to overcome a lot of adversity this year but Tennessee is not some juggernaut they're not some oh my gosh Tennessee they're destroying playoff teams I don't know I I, I was watching this game literally in my head thinking I can't wait to watch the Titans play against the Pittsburgh Steelers a team that plays really really good defense Tennessee is good running game against the Steelers really good run defense would be really interesting and then I looked at the schedule and oh my gosh guess what And if a week seven, this upcoming Sunday, we're going to see Tennessee play against Pittsburgh. We'll see the Titans versus the Steelers. It's going to be really fun, really interesting. And uh, that's a game that I feel like is a a playoff game in the making. They might play once week seven and then again in the playoffs. So keep your eye on that game. Steelers-Titans on Sunday. The matchup up front is going to be really interesting. Do the Steelers dominate up front on defense, or do the Titans run the ball well, or does the answer somewhere lie in the middle? I don't know, Um, but I am not all in on Tennessee the way a lot of other people are, Uh, and I thought that this Tennessee-Texans game kind of proved that to some degree. Now, the Jaguars and the Lions. I said going in, I was worried about the Jaguars quarterback, Gardner Minshew, and I was right to some degree. The Lions won this game 34-16. to Gardner Minshew had a really bad interception throwing deep down the left sideline to DJ Chark where the ball hung in the air too long. And the question with Gardner Minshew right now 
is arm talent. I watched that interception to DJ Chark, and I went, you know what? Trevor Lawrence would make that throw. And Gardner had two turnovers. He had a fumble. He had an interception. The Lions are a solid enough football team that if you give them opportunities, they're going to beat you. And for me, the story is that Gardner had a number of misses that you just cannot miss. He had a throw where he got, he did get hit as he threw, but he had a uh, DJ Chark open in the end zone. And again, he missed the throw into the end zone. And you just can't miss those throws. And so Gardner's got to play better or else he's going to get himself replaced in Jacksonville. And so, uh, again, decision-making is not the problem for Gardner Minshew. The problem is arm talent. He's missing throws that you just like – the accuracy and the, vertic- the vertical ability to throw the football, it's got to be better. And I don't know that that's a thing you can fix mid-year. So I am afraid that if the Jaguars – in fact, I know this for a fact. If the Jaguars have a high enough draft pick where they can replace Gardner Minshew – they're going to do it. And that's that's this game confirmed that for me. I went, yeah, Gardner, I love him. He's this great dude, great personality. We actually went to college together. Um, and not like we weren't in classes together, but I, I was in the moment when he was at Washington State. I was on the sideline for those games. It was really fun. I feel this emotional connection to Gardner Minshew. But unfortunately, he's not justifying his spot on the roster right now. And uh, I think he's good. He's, he's solid. He's a, definitely a good backup of nothing else. But I think Gardner's got to play better down the road if he wants to keep his job in Jacksonville. Uh, and I, I guess there's a, a feeling of complacency with Jacksonville where if they have a, chan- a shot at Trevor Lawrence, they're going to take it. If not, they're fine with Gardner Minshew for now. But Gardner Minshew is unfortunately proving that he's duct tape rather than the long term answer. And I just wanted to see more and wanted to see better from Gardner Minshew this year. Now, the Packers and the Buccaneers. Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers. Oh, my goodness. I was excited for this game. And I was expecting this great, phenomenal game. Two playoff teams, you know, trading blows. Oh, my gosh, it's going to be fun. And uh, I was even confident that the Packers were going to win this game. I went, man, the Packers had the bye week to prepare. So the Packers had two weeks to think about and strategize for this game. And guess what? The Buccaneers dominated. The Buccaneers won this game 38 to 10. Are you who I just did not see that coming. I was shocked. So the Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski connection was on full display. They looked the same way they did in New England a couple of years ago. And I was shocked at how bad Aaron Rodgers, the Packers quarterback, played. He had two interceptions. He should have had three. Antoine Winfield Jr. Dropped a pick later in the game. A-Rod also missed Mercedes Lewis wide open on a second and 10 where there's nobody around him. Mercedes Lewis was literally wide open over the middle. I've never seen Aaron Rodgers miss a guy wide open like that. Almost like, it was almost like Aaron Rodgers was just overthinking the throw and not confident or something was weird there. Uh, He also once lost track of the play clock and took a delay game penalty. Aaron Rodgers was not his typical self in this game. And, it's really the worst I've ever seen Aaron Rodgers play in a football game. And I guess the takeaway from this game is that we learned what the Buccaneers are capable of when they play penalty-free football. So the Buccaneers have, you know, th- their problem all year has been, yeah, they're really good. Uh, at times, they play good defense. They've got exciting receivers. they got Tom Brady. But they're not disciplined. They really, really, uh, against the Bears, for example, they had a ton of penalties and cost themselves Multiple times where I said, this team is not good enough to win a Super Bowl. And it's the problem is discipline. So a big key in this game, yeah, the Buccaneers' defense is awesome. Tom Brady's the star. The defense deserves the credit here and there. The, the defense of the, the Buccaneers is what really needs the eyeballs. They're the key to their victory. But another key to their victory is they got to be disciplined. And when they're disciplined, oh my gosh, the Buccaneers look like a Super Bowl team. Uh, they had zero penalties on Sunday. That's a big deal. And I also, I don't think we're ever going to see another... Green Bay Packers game where they might lose again that badly. They lost really badly to the 49ers last year. But I don't think we're ever going to see another Packers game where Aaron Rodgers plays quite that badly ever again in your lifetime, unless he's like 48 years old and hobbled and can barely run and is just falling apart mentally and emotionally and everything. So I just, I thought it was an uncharacteristically bad game for Aaron Rodgers and kind of the ceiling for the Buccaneers where they played an incredibly almost mistake-free football game, which when you do that, they're going to win by a lot of points, and the Buccaneers did on Sunday. 
Now, the Cardinals and the Dallas Cowboys, this game was a home game for Dallas, technically in Arlington, Texas. Uh, I was right about this game. I have said that the Cowboys were going to get blown out by the Arizona Cardinals. I've been saying that since my NFL prediction episode for the Cardinals where I said they were going to go 12-4. and four. I've been saying this since September or even August. Andy Dalton, the Dallas Cowboys quarterback, you know, the replacement for Dak Prescott, had two interceptions. Ezekiel Elliott, the Cowboys running back, had back-to-back fumbles. That led to two Cardinals touchdowns. So the Cardinals won the game 38-10. to And my takeaway here is that I-, I thought the Cardinals didn't even play that great of a football game. The Cowboys are just awful. Their defense is terrible. They need a defensive tackle badly. They need a new safety. The Cardinals ran for 261 yards. You remember, Cliff Kingsbury, the Cardinals coach, runs a, quote, air raid offense. So the fact that you gave up 200, over 250 yards rushing to Arizona? The Cowboys defense is a mess. They're awful. They're terrible. They need help. They're a big problem. And uh, I just, this is a loss I saw. I saw this in the works for a long, long time with the Cowboys and I thought this was rather obvious for a long, long time. Time. Now, uh, the final game I want to talk about. And th- by the way, there was no Thursday night football game. So there last week in week six. So uh, totally fine there. The Thursday night game was supposed to be Kansas City and Buffalo. So let's talk about it. That game happened on Monday instead. The Chiefs and the Bills. My fear was that Kansas City was going to pull away in this game and you know take kind of pull away late. And I, I wanted a hyper-competitive football game where the Bills and the Chiefs kind of came down to the final play. That did not happen. Kansas City won 26-17. to And I thought the story here was that Kansas City, with a bunch of replacement, kind of a lot of shuffling around on the offensive line, you know, a bunch of backups, basically. Three players that were not playing where they normally would play on the Kansas City offensive line. In spite of that, the Chiefs' offensive line dominated up front. Like, the Bills got embarrassed physically. Clyde edwards helaire the running back for Kansas City, ran for 161 yards. That cannot happen. Patrick Mahomes was incredibly efficient. And uh, I guess really my takeaway here is that I want to see Buffalo be willing to commit to their running game a little bit more. They they keep going away from their running game. And, I mean, they had, they had multiple downs where three and outs where Buffalo would throw the ball you know, first and 10, second and 10, third and 10, three incompletions, then punt the ball away. It's like, run the football. You got a good running back. What are you doing? I don't understand. And so the Bills have been sloppy now two weeks in a row. They've lost two games in a row as a result of that. Buffalo has got to clean things up. Uh, This feels like the year for Buffalo where they're going to win their division. They're going to overtake the Patriots. Buffalo plays the Jets this week. And in two weeks, they play the New England Patriots. And uh, Buffalo's got to clean things up if they want to achieve their goals later on this year. Now, guys, that's all I have. That is my entire – so my my counter says 49 minutes and 40 seconds. It'll probably be about 45 minutes or something like that. Uh, I had to cut out a couple moments early on. Uh, I, I also had to do the intro like three times for whatever reason. I just was like really nervous for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it though. I really um, – I think it is maybe worthy of being its own standalone episode, the predictions versus reality week to week. If it makes sense, I'll do it next week too. I think it'd be really fun. Uh, The NFL is kind of a mess right now where COVID is causing teams to cancel practice. Teams are playing way more messy than I've ever seen before uh, because there's not a lot of preparation going on. It feels like it feels like teams are, it's one thing in a zoom meeting to talk about. This is our game plan. But if you, aren't repping things out. You can draw something up. And if you draw something up, that's a great idea. But if you don't do a walkthrough and run through it a couple times full speed, um, it may be a problem. So I don't know. I I think the NFL is on a weird spot right now, and I don't see a way to fix it because of COVID. You're just doing the best you can week to week, and it's a 2020 is a crazy, weird year in the NFL. Um, Now, I'm excited to watch the Giants and Eagles right after this. Um, And uh, I just, I hope you're doing well. I hope you enjoy that. I've never done a predictions versus reality for a mid-season week of the NFL ever before. Uh, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. I hope you have a great day. That's all I have. But um bum bam, we are done.